Mm. I think at times I was absolutely terrified of a lot of the things I did and I covered it up by um, by a big extrovert front mm. and I was probably more scared at times than people ever knew or recognised. You're listening to Simon Scriver's Amazingly Ultimate Fundraising Superstar Podcast, talking all things fundraising, charities, nonprofits, and more. Here's your host, as always, Simon Scriver. So a few months ago, I was uh, very honored to be hosting the fundraising awards at IOF Scotland. Um, and one of the things when you're able to tell crappy jokes and, and present awards is people mistake you for being important. And what happens is people then put you on a table with other important people. Um, and what happened was I actually managed to sit next to my guest today. And this is the first time I got a chance to meet her. She is Amanda Bringins. Hello, Amanda. Hello. How are you, Simon? I'm okay. How are you? I'm all right, thank you. It's Friday. It's Friday, yeah, and yes. we're, we're nearly, like? nearly broken up for Christmas, so everyone's yeah. happy. Absolutely. Um, well, apart from uh, apart from Theresa May, God love her. Oh my God, yeah. I'm sorry you're going through all that. <laughs> I, hope, I hope you survive. Yeah, you're going to be in a worse situation when the border goes all horribly wrong. Oh my God. Okay, we're not, this is not a political podcast. It's we're not. not. Let's talk about fundraising. Yeah, let's talk about fundraising because you are the number three most influential fundraiser according to Fundraising Magazine. Did you know that? Uh, I did know that. <laughs> he's, Not he's, quite sure what to say. But, you know, it's, well, if, if somebody voted for me to get me to that place, then I'm happy and very delighted about we, that. Very we should be. I mean, you are very influential. You are the director of fundraising at British Heart Foundation. Yeah. And you are the current chair of the Institute of Fundraising. Yeah. And you also serve as a trustee and you're, you're everything. <laughs> What do you mean, Simon? Yeah. Um, I am lucky enough to be doing two or three amazing things as part of my professional career. Yes. Yeah. So, yes, I'm director of fundraising at the British Heart Foundation, you know, which is a, a, a well-established, fantastic charity with a great brand and a wonderful heritage, you know, not without its challenges like every charity at the moment. Um, and we can, I'm sure we can talk about that. Um, the Institute of Fundraising, is, as everyone will know, or I hope some of your listeners will know, um, a, a fantastic membership organisation that represents fundraisers all across the UK. Um, and that's, of course, how we came to meet when we were both together at the, uh, the Scottish IOF conference, which was pretty good, actually, I thought. Really good. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and finally, I'm a trustee at Regents University, which is an independent university um, and also a charity. And they are in the middle of setting up their first fundraising function. They've never really had one before. So I'm kind of helping with that. So, yes, I'm I'm lucky to be able to contribute to fundraising across the UK because I love fundraising and I love fundraisers. You, you keep talking about being lucky, but I'm, all, I'm always of the thought that the harder you work, the luckier you get. And I can see from your, um, you know, from your past work and everywhere you are, you obviously work very hard. You obviously are very good at what you do. And I would love to pick your brain about fundraising and understand you a bit more. Yeah. How, did, how did you become a fundraiser? Did you fall into it like everyone else? Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, I, well, I, I became a fundraiser very many years ago. You know, I'm unfeasibly old now. Um, yeah. And as we come into Christmas at the end of a very long year, I must admit, I'm beginning to feel even older. Um, but... I think more people are choosing fundraising as a career now, but certainly when I became a fundraiser, that was not the case. Um, so I was working in advertising, selling advertising on the telephone, actually. Oh, God. And I, think, I think when I was at the conference where I met you, I spoke about this on the platform, but I used to sell advertising on the telephone and I sold it in North London, Camden Town, um, working for Thompson Regional Newspapers. And that was my very first job in a great big, massive building that um, uh, many people will know just outside Mornington Crescent Tube Station, which is the Black Cat building. It's a beautiful old Art Deco building uh -huh. um, where Thompson Regional Newspapers used to be based. So that was my first job. Um, 
wearing a literally ancient old um what's that stuff uh bakelite um head headphone telephone headphone oh yeah 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 thing with a bloody great big horn that came around the side yeah. um for the for the microphone it was just it was a it was a terrible job i absolutely hated it um was it it was went, cold cold calling uh, yeah, yeah, completely. Yeah, yeah which yeah. of course you, you can't do now. We, we we used to cut leads out of the newspapers to follow up, and then you could could hound whoever you wanted. Yeah, wanted is that not get... legitimate interest now? <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I don't think we'd get away with that, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I went through my career in advertising um, uh, for about nine years, selling mm -hmm. uh, newspaper advertising and then television advertising. And honestly, Simon, I just got. I just got sick of it. You know, it yeah. was fun. It was the 80s. There was a lot of money around. I had a big expense account. I had a car. It wow. was, you know, it was great. Um, you know, we had very long lunches and, uh, you know, got up to all sorts of shenanigans in the afternoon <laughs> after long lunches. Um, but it's not very rewarding, or at least it wasn't for me. Yeah. And I made a decision to uh, change careers, but I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Went back to university, did a degree in English literature at Goldsmiths, which is a really cool university. Um, absolutely loved that. Came out, happened to see a job advertised um, at Comic Relief and went and did Red Nose Day in 95. Wow. And then, you know, like however many years later, I go to work at the BHF. I walk out of the tube at Mornington Crescent Tube Station. I look across the road and I realise that the British Heart Foundation is in the same building as my first job at Thompson Regional Newspapers. Wow. So I am now walking out of the tube every day to go into the Black Cat building, which, as I said, is beautiful, which is what I used to do every day when I was 22. Um, mm. So it's funny how what goes around comes around. But also, fundraising is a great career to be in. But I'd say you sleep better at night now, now that you're um, selling something better than advertising. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But then... You know what us girls are like, and maybe some of you guys as well, we worry about stuff, don't we? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, of course, when fundraising is going well, it's it's great, and I love it. But at the moment, things are tough, so uh -huh. don't always sleep well at night. Yeah, well, it's, it is a tough job. And, I mean, when it's going well, it's the best job in the world, and when it's going badly, it's one it's of the fun. worst jobs in the world. <laughs> no, so, it's not the worst job. It'll yeah. never be that, Simon. Okay. But, it, but, it, but it's hard, and I'm, I'm sure – how many people listen to your podcast? Oh, millions. Oh, mi millions. Yeah, millions. yeah. It's so I'm growing. sure all the millions of fundraisers out there will know what we mean when we say it can be tough, even though it's fabulous. Yeah, no, I love it. I love it. So Comic Relief back in back in those days, that's like the yeah. mid-90s. Yes, 95. 95. I, I don't want to make you feel old, <laughs> um, but I remember being in school. I mean, I feel old, but I remember being in school for Comic Relief 95. I remember Do you? That. Yeah. Wow. That was, and I remember, I mean, I have... A really gross story about what people were doing with their red noses and stuff Ew. like that. But, but I, won't, know, we, I won't. We we we. I can I can I'm, I can imagine actually. So perhaps we better not go there. But it still generated money for you, so you should be should be delighted. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um and what was comic relief back but like back in those days i mean it's um, like it was still huge it was still a monster wasn't it uh it well it wasn't because it started when did it start 88 i think was the first one wasn't it yeah around then was I it think. 86 maybe even know. earlier yeah um and um so it was still you know relatively young and the fundraising office was in a um Uh, uh, an old beam around the back road, which no longer exists, it's been knocked down. Mm -hmm. And we were the only residents, I think, in that building before it was about to be demolished. So the fundraising office was kind of out on a limb slightly. Mm. Um, and uh, Amanda, Amanda Horton Mastin um, was my boss. So many people will know her because she was until I think quite recently uh, still at Comic Relief doing a great job. Um, and it was it was the office was makeshift and everybody was passionate and committed and uh, mostly working on short contracts so there was no permanent fundraising team at that time we, okay. people were just recruited for six months prior to the red nose day to kind of build up the fundraising efforts and do uh -huh. more cold calling to people to get them on board and we used to get visits from richard curtis and lenny henry and uh -huh. the other celebs who were involved and so that made the fundraising team feel Oh, I don't know, special and, yeah, and 
and even more dedicated. And even though it was kind of a bit makeshift, because you were at the cutting edge of doing the work, you know, mm. hitting the phones, going to visit people in a very intense period in the run up to Red Nose Day, it was just a wonderful, fun, hard work, intense atmosphere. Yeah. And then at the end of it, you know, there's a fabulous rap party. Um, and I can remember Chris Evans being there and Jonathan Ross and um, uh, Vic Greaves and Bob Mortimer. And, oh, yeah. you know, and it was back in the day when those guys used to enjoy a beer or two. Um, <laughs> and it was, it was, you know, it was fabulous. Absolutely yeah. fabulous. And sitting in the audience, I can remember the night of Red Nose Day 95, sitting in the audience with my fellow fundraisers, yeah. four or five of us. And we just sat there in tears going, you know, we did this. We raised, we helped to raise all this money. Yeah, amazing. Um, and I'm sure the guys who work on it now feel exactly the same, but it is much bigger and much yeah. more of a machine. Yeah. But, even, but then it was just it was just so immediate and so real. Yeah, it, it's and kind of rare. rare it. It's rare in fundraising. Not, not rare, but like there's very few people who have that opportunity where you fundraise for something and you see something so big and tangible Completely. to almost celebrate it to like bookend the end of your um yeah all your work you know we get we get a, a bit of feedback and a bit of stuff we see in terms of the impact we have but that's huge you know yeah. celebrities. It, was, it was it was and it was it was fabulous huge and fabulous that's really cool so yeah. that's sw that switch from advertising to fundraising mm. is it the same the, the skills the you're using I mean, um, is it the same i mean no of course it's not the same um but you know, I remember I was back in advertising. I was in advertising a long time ago, and yeah. advertising isn't like that anymore. You know, yeah. yes, of course, people have the odd long lunch, but I mean, you know, <laughs> back in the eighties, it was it was it was work hard and play play very very hard. I don't mm. think that kind of culture exists quite in quite the same way. Um, so it was a big, it, it it was a welcome and pleasant change to come into an environment where where people were doing something that they genuinely care about um mm -hmm. in a different way and are committed because of the cause um was it different i mean when i first came into fundraising there weren't too many professional fundraisers around mm -hmm. um you know there were databases didn't work or, or were non-existent um everything was paper-based offices were a mess yeah. fundraising in in the larger charities tended to be retired um army guys Principally. Okay. You know, yeah. I can't count the number of times I've worked for Lieutenant Colonel this or <laughs> Major that um, <laughs> in, my, in my early days, because yeah. um, that's where fundraisers came from. You know, they came up through grassroots communities and then they went to work at a local charity or you know whatever. So and and so it is now so much more professional, so much more, so much. I don't want to say better. It's not better. It's yeah. It's it's differently run now. It's yeah. fundraising is differently run now and is much more professional and is much more of a proper in inverted commas career. Um, and I welcome that, you know, and that's what the Institute is trying to do as well. You know, professionalize fundraising. Yeah. And they do and, it very well. Get all the guys, you know, you meet so many fundraisers in your job, same as I do, and get them proper recognition yeah. for the efforts that they that they make. Yeah. Well, I think that's a big change is it's actually recognized as something you yeah. can do and like you said i mean iof have done more work in terms of helping people choose it as a career as opposed to yeah. falling into it which i think is a good thing but but communication is has has um crossed over into all your roles and you're obviously a good communicator so like you know you talk about picking up the phone for advertising you talk about picking up the phone for comic relief is that do you find like that's dying out a little bit the ability to actually talk on the phone to actually speak to people you know it's it's moving to digital a lot but is that necessarily good for fundraising nobody's ever asked me that before that's a good point um so i i i don't think it's as simplistic as that as saying whether that's a good thing or a bad thing so i mean we all have phones on our desks at work they're very rarely used mm. So people are talking to um, agencies, donors, supporters, um, much less on the phone, I think. Yeah. And in, in terms of our community fundraising colleagues, they're doing a lot of face-to-face -face work. Um, but digital communication now is the norm, isn't it? Mm. Um, 
So are we losing the ability to communicate? No, because I think we're learning how to communicate in different ways. Uh, you know, doing doing fabulous digital communication. You know, we're doing a podcast that would have been unheard of a few years ago. Doing fabulous personalized stewardship journeys on a digital in a digital space is, is important. So it may have changed. You may not have to pick up the phone and sell your wares over the phone, but uh, but communication is 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 just as important. But it's, yeah. but, it's but it's different. Yeah, it adapts to the technology and whatever else comes. Yeah. yeah. So in your career, you you moved on from there and you got big names under your belt. I mean, you've worked for Macmillan, yeah. uh, Battersea, VSO, kind of all these household names. Mm. But more, I suppose, you've obviously moved up and up and up. So now you're, you're a director. You're managing mm. fundraisers. Is that as opposed to fundraising? I mean, do you do much hands-on fundraising these days or is it very much strategy and guiding people through it? It's much more... Um leadership and strategy yeah 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 much more so i was very lucky in that after red nose day in my job i went straight to macmillan so i was at macmillan for a long time 17 years um mm -hmm. and i was very lucky to have a boss who advocated for me very strong uh, strongly and was a wonderful woman judy beard and she's retired now but she was director of fundraising at the british red cross and then she went to macmillan um and we just hit it off and she she was the one she was like my mentor um mm -hmm. and promoted me a couple of times and eventually i became director of fundraising after she left macmillan so having somebody who is um on your side as it were um, yeah. really helped me to progress through my career and um i think getting those opportunities i mean you know i know you i want to say lucky again but mm. you do have to put yourself in the way of those opportunities don't you yeah. so i always advise people whenever i speak you know put your hand up put your hand yeah. up for a, for a project or a job or a piece of work that you feel passionate about you know get yourself in front of the boss and say i want to do this um and, and i did that and that that really helped me to move through um and yes i have been lucky to work for big brands um but I wanted to work for big brands. You know, I went to, for my sins, I went to boarding school. You know, I'm used to big institutions and yeah. big organizations and how they work. Yeah. And I know how to maneuver my way around them and how to influence and negotiate. Um, so, so I like big organizations. Um, and of course, in a big organization, when you're leading a big fundraising team, which I'm lucky enough to do, um, inevitably your role is going to become more about strategy and leadership mm. and management and talking to trustees and and i like that yeah i i i really enjoy leadership do, you know, i do, like i like fundraisers you know and i'm i'm delighted and proud to lead a team of fundraisers and you like managing people because i i've yeah, fallen yeah, in and out of love of managing people <laughs> I've never fallen out of love with managing people, so you're a very you're a very positive spin person, aren't you? I want to I want to get you to criticize something in fundraising. Oh no, of course well, I can do that as well. But, um, <laughs> so, but, um, but no, I, I, I do. I genuinely love leading people. Seriously, are you a good manager? Are you a good leader? Um, I don't know. You'd have to ask them. Um, I, I think I'm probably I think I'm probably a little inconsistent at times. Um, yeah. I get impatient. Um, I try to do performance management fairly if I need to. I try to describe and lead people towards a clear vision. Mm -hmm. I try to support people in their careers to get development. Um, I, I don't. I don't suffer fools. Um, mm. I'm too picky about grammar and punctuation. Oh dear. <laughs> yeah, no, I think my team will tell you that. That's that comes from boarding school, I think. I know. I think that just comes from being. I don't know what it is. No, I know that I, you know, I'm joking. I think yeah. my always say there's some things she does which really piss us off. Um, yeah, yeah. But hopefully, um, overall, I'm. Okay. And so, um, in terms of managing your teams and people, it's a, I get the impression from the little that I know you that it's important to you to support people and bring them up and help them develop because people have done that for you in your career. Correct. You know, you you just talked about that. So, um, what's how do you do that like how do you support people what's why do people get held back and what's the difference between someone going forward and maybe not going forward that's a good question okay so i think i think people when no let me start that sentence again for you simon when people recognize mm -hmm. and have a level of self-awareness 
about what their strengths and areas for development are, mm. it is far easier for them to move on and develop. And the successes that I have had with leading people and supporting them to be promoted and move through their careers have come about because they've recognized what they need to do better and what they do well. Mm -hmm. I have spotted those things. We have talked about them together. And I have said, right, I think there's an opportunity here that you could, you should grasp, you should mm -hmm. take. Mm -hmm. And you know how, if you have the right instincts about people and you can spot where there's a huge talent then I think it is incumbent upon you as a leader to support and direct that talent. Huh. That's good. Um, yeah, it's, it's vital. And the people who don't progress are sometimes because they don't want to, and that's okay. You know, if you're a specialist yeah. in a particular area and you want to stay in that area of your career, then, then, then cool, do it. Yeah. Um, but if you're going to get stuck and for some reason you can't work on your problems and develop and grow, then that's a harder nut to crack, isn't it? Mm -hmm. on, on, a, on an episode of a while ago, I was mm -hmm. talking to Joe Jenkins. Do you know Joe Jenkins? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's a, he's a friend of the podcast. Yeah, um, he's but, a good guy. but he wrote an article about there being a talent crisis um, in the sector. And I was talking to him and Nikki Bell, who is yes. a British, oh. Art, British Art Foundation. Yeah, love Nikki. Hi, Nikki. He's another friend of the podcast. Um, and we were talking about, you know, is there a talent crisis or what's coming up? One of, one of Nikki's points was, you know, she was talking about diversity, which I know is really important to you. I've heard you speak about diversity in the sector. Mm -hmm. um, she was talking about it from kind of a, a regional area and a working class area. And I've heard you speak about it from, from you know, people of color um, and from women and, and how we bring those other voices in. This is this is this is something that's important to you in your management, isn't it? I, I yeah. gather. Yes, um, I I wouldn't say that we have a talent crisis. I think there is a plethora of talent out there, um, and I see. Um, you know, being in being being in a big charity for whom lots of people hopefully want to work, I'm mm. I'm I'm in a position where I'm seeing many more fundraisers come through, mm -hmm. and I do appreciate that when you work in a smaller charity or a tiny charity, and you're in the middle of um, a rural area or um, far from a town or a city, then it is of course going to be more difficult to recruit talent in inverted commas. Um, that's not that it doesn't exist. Mm. Um, it's more about whether we have the resources, um, the skills and the ability to be able to access it. Um, so all the work that the Institute does on pushing out the qualifications, the move towards chartered status for fundraisers, mm -hmm. the diversity work that the Institute is doing, all of that is, is, is geared towards increasing the talent pool. Mm. So I think it's more about our ability to access the talent and grow and develop it rather than an absence of it. Yeah, like the talent crisis, if not for want of a better word, it's on our side in terms of opening the door as opposed to the people who are trying to get in that door. Yeah, yeah. And we need to be better at that. And I think, I mean, what are the Institute of Fundraising's priorities in terms of um, um, with you as the chair? What are you trying to change yeah. right now? So uh, the uh, the equality, diversity, and inclusion work that mm. the institute is doing is is vital um, to for us to do exactly that to increase the talent pool and to to make the profession more diverse. Because if we, you know, the business case for diversity is clear. If you have a more diverse workforce, you are inevitably ultimately more successful. Mm -hmm. You have to you get better ideas, you get a better breadth and depth of opinions and ways of working. Um, so I think there's a strong business case for diversity, which the corporate sector has, has, has done a lot of work on and made really clear. There's a moral case for it as well. Yeah. You know, we have to reflect 
the, uh, the populations we serve, our beneficiaries, better than we do. Um, and therefore, that that work, the EDI work that we're doing, I think is 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 crucial for the future of fundraising as a rich and vibrant profession. Yeah. Um, and there are, you may have seen that the, the Change Collective, which is the name for the work that we're doing, yeah. launched a gosh, a couple of weeks ago now, and there's a manifesto for change, which, which clearly lays out the priorities and the pieces of work that we're going to do, you know, around women in leadership, about supporting organizations to think better and more proactively about increasing diversity in their fundraising workforce. So I'm really proud of that work. Um, and then linked to that is the journey towards chartered status. Now, that's mm -hmm. an interesting conversation. There's mixed opinions about that. You know, is becoming a chartered fundraiser um, an old fashioned construct or is it something that actually for some fundraisers, perhaps who are alone or sole fundraisers in smaller organizations will bring them uh, more status and more yeah. um, kudos and uh, recognition in a way that would actually be welcomed by their boards of trustees um, and and their beneficiaries, et cetera. So that's a, that's a very much a live debate. The, the, pe the people who are saying it's old, you know, old fashioned, what's, what's their alternative? Uh, so let's just rehearse the argument about it being old fashioned. I mean, if, I, I think that that argument comes essentially and, and, and possibly from sometimes from the people who work for larger charities in a metropolitan setting mm. who perhaps wouldn't feel the need to have their fundraisers called chartered fundraisers mm. or to bit, for a bit the, the chartered institute of fundraising. So if you're in an environment where fundraising is recognized and supported and invested in, why would you need it? You know? Yeah. What's it going to bring? Yeah. Um, and what's the alternative to that? I I'm not sure that anybody's put forward a viable yeah. alternative to it. Um, you know, should we have a movement, for example, to push fundraising into the spotlight? You know, something like Me Too. Um, let Let's make fundraising a fabulous, sexy profession for people to come into by by utilizing other means. Mm. Um, I think that the argument for chartered status has been made very clearly and the, the, it was agreed by the IOF trustees 2014, I think, so about four years ago, um, and was put on the back burner when we went through 2015, the summer of 2015, when things became difficult for fundraising, as we all remember, yeah. and it's very much been brought back to the table now since I've been working with Peter as, as chair. Yeah. Um, and I'm 100% for it because I yeah. think for certain sectors of the fundraising profession, it will bring huge benefits. Yeah, no, it seems like a great thing for me. I've worked in small organizations before, and most of my clients are small, and it's usually a fundraiser who is not respected as a profession, you know, or is right. kind of ostracized from the rest of the the, the uh, organization. And I, I like the sound of it. I think it sounds yeah. it's positive. And fundraising is still seen, isn't it, um, by many organizations as, you know, a bit kind of... It's it's a necessary evil. Yeah, you know all yeah. that all, all that asking for money. You know, it's all yeah. Yeah. It's a we little bit like embarrassing, that. isn't it? Yeah, so. we, yeah, we don't like that. We're terribly British about it. Yeah, um, and we have to get over that. You know, that whole point about aligning um, mission. Um, you know, delivering your mission and vision with income generation. We yeah. have to get over our fear of doing that. Yeah, it's part but of it's, what we do. Yeah. I, I, do you remember the IOF? Was that in your time? Your time um, as the chair, the IOF campaign, proud fundraiser. No, it was before my time. Great fundraiser. You know, everybody remembers that campaign. That was yeah. that was fabulous. Really effective. Yeah, there's something really strong. I mean, really effective for those who are already proud. I don't know if it changed anyone's minds on the outside, but I loved it. it like it did make me feel proud. And I remember it's going to the IOF convention, and people people wearing those and saying that, and it was it was great. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Um, I'm curious. I don't want to keep you too long because you're a busy woman. It's okay. Um, <laughs> what's um, what's your priorities? What's next for you? Personally? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, um, I, so I'm right in the middle of implementing the fundraising strategy at the British Heart Foundation. Yeah. Um, we have a lot to do. So we have a brand that is well loved and respected. Um, but the perception of the British Heart Foundation amongst the the public is is that you know we're probably that there isn't an urgent need for money. 
you know, mm -hmm. thinking about the name foundation, that's quite an interesting um, uh, construct, isn't it? Sometimes people think that we are wealthier than we actually are. Yeah. Um, but heart disease is not seen as such an urgent cause as say cancer. And the new brand that we put out earlier this year and the new fundraising strategy, which I'm implementing now is taking up all of my time. So at the moment, I'm completely focused on getting the fundraising team um, who are amazing, by the way. Hello, mm -hmm. all of you. Um, getting them absolutely resourced up to be able to deliver the income generation aspirations that we have. So that's my first priority. Um, personally, I have to think about, you know, because as I said to you at the beginning, I am unfeasibly old. I have to think about what I want to do next. Um, mm. And I've still got loads to do at the British Heart Foundation. But in the back of my mind, it's, hmm, yeah. you know, what do I do? Where do I go? And I don't want to be a consultant. Um, yeah. One day, do I want to be a chief executive? Perhaps I do. And there aren't enough yeah, women. Do you, do you? I, don't, I don't know, Simon. Sometimes <laughs> I think, do you know what? Sometimes I think I do. And sometimes, yeah, yeah. oh, my God, that yeah. scares the pants off me. Yeah. Um, oh, you'd be great. Well, I'd do my best, put it like that. Yeah. Um, so while I am focused absolutely on the British Heart Foundation, I'm thinking about, you know, in, in five, six, seven years, what do I do? Where yeah. Do? Yeah. Oh God, it, it's hard to know. I mean, do you, do you like, um, do you look back on your career and do you think like, like how, how do you stop burning out? Because you've just kind of kept moving and kept moving and moving up and done more and more. Are you, like, I worry about you, Amanda. <laughs> Don't talk nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, listeners, he says he worries. I doubt it. Sometimes. I do. Are you, are you gonna, are you, are you um, gonna, well, thank you for that. Are you going to keep pushing? Uh, uh, for, for the moment, yes, absolutely. Um, I think I think it's a mixture of taking time out to make sure that you can recharge your batteries mm -hmm. and also having that monkey on your shoulder, which all of us have, mm. which drives so many of us on, which is you're not quite good enough. Mm. You've got that imposter syndrome always going on. And that certainly drives me um, to always want to do better and to, to progress and to go for new challenges. So to all of you out there who kind of wake up in the morning feeling sometimes anxious or sometimes worried about what you're going to do next, you know, yeah, breathe it in, accept it, go with it, but use it. It's yeah, like you Judy Dench always says, she gets nerves and she she gets terrified before she goes on stage and she says, but you know what? I treat it like rocket fuel. Yeah. You As still get that? I'm nervous. Yeah, of course. Every time. But it's good. Yeah. Treat yeah. it like rocket fuel. Use it to fuel your next move, your next project, your next, your next, your next big thing. Yeah. I think I I do think everyone has that self doubt where you you know sometimes you're wearing your suit and you feel like a little kid dressed up in <laughs> yeah. parents' clothes or Yeah. Um, even the most powerful people in the world, or sometimes especially the most powerful people in the world. Of course, and sometimes that's why they're the most powerful people. Yeah. In the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, in your in your career, like looking back, what would you say to little Amanda, to young Amanda who's just starting off, even just starting off in advertising or just starting off in the in fundraising sector? What do you wish you'd known? God. Mm. Oh, maybe you knew it all, did you? No, sort of. Um... What do I wish I'd say? Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you know I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm slightly lost for word. I think I was. That's not I like think, you, Amanda. You, I've never seen you lost for words yet. I think I was. Mm. I would have get. I would. I would have given my. I would have given myself confidence a bit of a boost. I think when I was younger. Mm. I think at times I was absolutely terrified of a lot of the things I did. And I covered it up by um, by a big extrovert front. And mm. I was probably more scared at times than people ever knew or recognized. And I look back on that now and I think there was no need. There was no need. So a bit of reassurance, I think, yeah. to my earlier self and to anybody else out there who kind of gets that same feeling sometimes. We all, we all need that sometimes, don't we? You know, we do. you're okay. You're, you're doing good. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, Amanda, if you ever get that feeling, uh, you can know that I think you're doing amazing. I think oh. you're great. So it's good. And I'm glad that um, we had you on here. 
Um, if anyone wants to know more about you or you want to point someone in the right direction, where, where can we keep an eye on what you're doing besides the most influential list? Where else do we find you? Um, so I'm, I'm an intermittent tweeter. Yeah. Um, I keep thinking that I should do more of it. Um, so it's, I think it's at Amanda Bringens. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I'm an even more intermittent LinkedIn person. Yeah. Um, but you will see occasional stuff out there. Um, I speak on platforms as often as I can uh, find the time to do so. Mm -hmm. um, and there's always the British Heart Foundation website, which is fabulous as well. So um, I'll try and I'll try and do a bit more tweeting if anybody wants to catch up. Yeah, you should hire someone to do it for you. <laughs> yes, that'd be nice. Yeah, that'd be great. All right, so we'll find you on Twitter. But yeah, I mean, I keep an eye on the British Heart Foundation because it's always very interesting to see what you guys do with your fundraising. Yeah. Because you're usually ahead of the curve. Um, so I'd recommend anyone else listen to this. Keep an eye on you through that, and we'll see you, see what happens to you on next year's most influential list. Do you move up? Do you move down? <gasps> or disappear together altogether? Yeah, start Who knows? Yeah, it would be good. Space. Thank right. you, Dan. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Have you? It was really no lovely to catch up. I was blown away when I met you. And it was like, you know, you know, when you have these dinners and you sit people next to people and they're always nice and they're always fine. But sometimes you have someone you like, there's that little spark and you just, oh. the, the night flies by. So it was really a pleasure to meet you and lovely yeah, to same. meet you. All right. So now we've both been incredibly nice to each other and bored the listeners to death. We yeah. can, we can we sign can. off and... Now, tell me three things you hate about me. <laughs> 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 all right okay thanks a million Amanda. Thank, thank you, you. see, you, see you later bye, -bye. bye. you've been listening to simon scriver's amazingly ultimate fundraising superstar podcast don't forget to subscribe and head over to changefundraising.com to learn more or get in touch with simon or don't whatever you're big enough to make your decisions hello this is morgan freeman for discounts on Simon's best-selling online fundraising courses, go to www.changefundraising.com forward slash training and use coupon code podcast. Complete them in your own time, wherever you want. Get busy living or get busy buying.